how much they create and how they use the money they create. Now, you will have seen from this morning that who creates it at the moment, the answer is banks. Banks create money. They create far too much of it and they use it for completely the wrong things, for speculative finance, uh, for gambling in financial markets and for pushing up house prices. So, going from that, if we go back to that first question, who creates it? Now, the key question here is, is there a conflict of interest with the person who's creating money? So, with the banks, the more that they create, the more profit they make, because uh, the more debt that they're collecting the interest on. So they have this complete conflict of interest where they want to lend as much as possible. Lending as much as possible creates as much money as possible for the economy. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, if we took that power to create money away from banks, gave it to politicians, would that deal with a conflict of interest? Um, it would probably make it worse because politicians would do exactly the same except there'd be not even the restrictions potentially going bust upon them. So it's not power that we can give to politicians and trust um, with you know, people who are trying to win the next election. And what I suggest is you need a, a body that is independent in some way, that doesn't have this conflict of interest. And the way you remove that conflict of interest is by separating the decision over how much money is created and how that money is used. Um, so that the people who are deciding whether to create it can't also benefit from making the decision about how it should be used. So if you if you look, for example, at uh, if so, one suggestion that we've put forward is that maybe the Monetary Policy Committee, instead of manipulating interest rates in the way they do at the moment, should be responsible for deciding whether to increase or de decrease the money supply directly. And um, if you also then gave them power over saying how should this money be used. And, for example, one of the MPC members lives in Birmingham, commutes every month into London for his, uh, his meeting with the MPC. And the discussion is about, do we create an extra 32 billion, and do we use it to pay for high-speed rail? Um, he's going to be swayed there by the, the idea of saving 20, 30 minutes on his journey from Birmingham into London. And that's going to lead him to not necessarily be taking the best uh, decision for the, for the economy. It's that conflict of interest is coming back in. So, what I would suggest is you need to separate that decision over how much money is created from the decision over how that money is used. Um, so, on to the question of how much we should actually create. And this decision could be taken by an independent body, it could be the Monetary Policy Committee, or we could set up some new, um, the British Monetary Authority, or whatever it is. The important thing is it's transparent and accountable and we can see what they're doing and they are accountable in some way to Parliament. Um, now, we've got to bear in mind that creating new money doesn't create new resources. It's not going to create any new oil, it's not going to create any new energy. What it can do is unlock existing resources. So right now we have about 3 million people sat at home doing absolutely nothing because there's not enough electronic numbers circulating through the economy to get them into jobs. So, we, we can't imagine that if we create all this money that you can deal with all the problems that we have. But by creating money and putting it towards the right areas of the economy, you can unlock a lot of the unused resources that are there at the moment, and also redirect resources away from uh, speculating on house building into actually producing things and increasing people's quality of life. Um, now the issue is, if you're creating too much money, that's going to feed through into inflation. And as we've seen in this morning, if the money's going into something like property, it's going to feed through into inflation in property. The inflation tends to happen wherever the money goes first. Um, if you're feeding the money into uh, production, so you're increasing how much goods and services there actually are, then in fact that should be deflationary, because uh, the more productive we are, the more the less resources we use to produce, say for example, a laptop or a new car, as we get more efficient, then it should actually be costing less for these things. So that can push prices down. But if you do, for example, do something stupid like double the money supply in a year, you'll see that feeding through into inflation. And we don't want this to happen. We need a safeguard to stop this happening. And the easy way to do that is to say, if inflation starts to accelerate, then stop creating money stop increasing the money supply. And it's, it's very simple, it's sort of a natural fail-safe. It doesn't rely on too much discretion or too much judgment or too much politics. 
Um, although, if we are using something like that as um, an accelerating rate of inflation being the, the warning sign to stop increasing the money supply, then we need a better measure of inflation. We don't want what we have at the moment where the Bank of England can say, oh, we've successfully managed inflation for the last 10 years, um, so long as you don't look at housing. <laughs> so, ignore the elephant. Right, and then on to this question about how they use that money, because um, that really is key to, to essentially the health of the economy and to what benefit that brings for us. Um, for me, Adam Posen's speech yesterday sounded like, let's give banks unlimited ability to create money, and then we'll run around afterwards trying to clean up the mess. It's, it's not dealing with the root of the problem, it's trying to restrict what happens once you're given them this power. Um, and we need to... So we need to really take that power away and then make sure that the money is used not for going into uh, property speculation or gambling on financial assets, but actually for something that's useful. So there is a range of options here. And we're going to have to, when we get to the point of realizing that we need to reform money, then we're going to need to have a big debate about how we specifically change the system. But just to lay out some options, this newly created money, which might be it could be in the region of 50 to 60 billion a year. It's not a huge amount of money relative to government budgets. It's less than 10% of their total spending power. Um, so it's a relatively modest amount of new money. Now, you could use that to increase government spending. Um, I think in the current situation, a lot of people might be skeptical about whether that money will be well used by the government, um, given some of the things that have happened over the last few years. You could use it to fund the existing government spending so that you can then collect less through taxes. And you could cut taxes, and there's various ways you could do that. If you cut corporation tax, if you want to appear to be business friendly. You could cut VAT if you want to lower everybody on the lowest incomes completely out of tax. Um, there's a range of different you know, tax options there. Uh, you could use it to pay down the national debt, which I don't actually think is a good idea. Um, mainly because any money used to pay down the national debt will then go straight into the stock market um, and into other financial assets. And also because a lot of our pensions are tied up in the national debt, so if you pay that down too quickly, you're forcing that money into uh, essentially riskier assets. Um, so although a lot of people would say we need to pay off the debt, that's not really the priority. Um, potentially quite a populist one, but what I think is a, a very good idea is to actually just divide it up between all 45 million adults in the UK and give everybody a cheque for £4,000 spread over 12 months, or however long. Um, and as Steve Keen has suggested, a very intelligent thing to do would be to say, if you have debts, use it to pay off your debt, and if you don't, then get a new TV, go on holiday, whatever you want. Um, or there's, you could be looking at... <laughs> You could be looking at investing in infrastructure or dealing with these big um, environmental challenges that we've got and the energy crisis that's coming up. So basically, uh, just to recap, banks, bankers and politicians are all guaranteed to abuse the power to create money. Um, there's very little chance that you could give them so much power and expect them to use it wisely. Uh, so we need to make this, power, this process of creating money transparent and accountable to the public and maybe accountable to parliament. And you've got to remove this conflict of interest where the people creating money are benefiting directly from creating that money. Um, we're going to have to thrash out how we actually use the money, and there's going to be a lot of competing um, arguments and demands from different people over how they want this new money to be used. Um, we've got to bear in mind that it's not going to create any new resources. It's not going to create any more oil. It's only going to redirect the existing resources that we have and potentially unlock resources. Um, and then... This discussion of, of reforming banking is, is very good and very encouraging. But the first thing we have to do is get people to understand that banks create money out of nothing, and that's the root of a lot of the problems that we have. Um, so a big public education project to come first, I think. So. Great, thank you very much. Oh, yeah, sorry. Then the next on the order of paper is Molly Scott-Kater. Okay, thank you. Um, I hope I'm going to maintain your interest through these 10 minutes. I'm going to do that by convincing you that we can't have any interest any longer in the economy. You can't earn money from your money. That's what I'm going to be arguing. Um, I'm a green economist, and so I'm 
as, at least as interested in the sustainability of the economy as I am in the stability of the economy. And those are going to be my first two points. How the money system affects the stability, or rather causes instability, and how it's related to sustainability. Um, I have to say that although I mentioned that I'm economic speaker for the Green Party, I'm speaking with a different hat on, which is my think tank hat, which is Greenhouse. And uh, we've published a, a proposal on banking, which you can find on our website, Greenhouse Think Tank, if you're interested in that. Okay, so I'm going to say three things, and I've got three graphs. Um, so, this is my first graph. It looks a bit like a lot of those graphs you saw this morning. I, I don't really believe in PowerPoint, because, you know, a mate of mine always calls it dis-in-PowerPoint. It always feels a bit like that. But it's hard to explain these things without any pictures at all, so I'm going to... Oh, I'm going to I'm going to draw you pictures on a board that doesn't really accept my pen, but it's a really weird board actually. Let's try again. Oh, that's a bit better. I could have two different colour lines, couldn't I? Anyway, basically the graph looks a bit like this. Oh, actually, I've been a bit generous there. So what this is a graph of is the growth in the money supply and the growth in the real economy, and that's being talked about a lot this morning. That's really important. We've seen a massive expansion in the amount of money but that hasn't been matched by an expansion in the size of the real economy. And this gap, I interpret as the, the um, potential for a collapse. Okay, so, so as these lines grow wider apart, the money system becomes more unstable, and it's trying to pull up GDP all the time, but it's basically, it's basically a bubble heading for a crash. So that is where the instability in the money system comes from. We've got a lot of, far more money than we've got real stuff in the economy, and so we're creating instability. But from a green economics point of view, there's, an, there's a, a serious, another serious problem here, perhaps a more serious problem. And that is that this line here that represents money is effectively a future call on goods and services. So you create money now through loans, but that money has to be repaid. And in order to be repaid, things have to be produced, real things. And when they're produced, energy is used and resources are called forth from the, the planet. And so this system of creating money in this way through debt, creating the money and allowing that to stimulate economic activity, is the main pressure for an unsustainably growing economy. Now, I admit, I'm going to do something Steve doesn't like, because I'm going to create an axiom. And my axiom is that you cannot have an economy that's going to grow forever within a limited planet. Now, a lot of people would argue about that, and I, I can't really find any way to argue with them, because to me it's just completely obvious. And, you know, if people want to come back in the questions and tell me why that's not right, that will be really, really interesting. Because I, I can't understand how people can say that you can have an economy that can grow forever within a limited planetary system. Um, so that's kind of point one, really, of green economics. And so why that's relevant to money creation is that when you... That, that money is used to stimulate economic growth. There's a very close relationship between creating money through this debt process and the pressure for growth within a capitalist economy. And so if you believe that you have to stop growth in order to safeguard um, our future as a species, then it's very important to, to change the way you create money. So, um, okay, let's, let's move on to my second graph. Because let's assume that we don't continue to create money in this way. Let, let's take Ben's proposal as point one. So we're going to stop creating money as debt. But is it still, even if you, you create 100% reserve ratio, if you still allow people to have interest... I would argue you're still creating that pressure for growth. It's not the same sort of voluminous pressure for growth, but there's still a pressure for growth there. And so my second graph, I'm going to have to show you this one, but basically the line looks just like this one, okay? Um, and I found this on the web somewhere, people saying the miracle of interest. This is the miracle of interest. If you've got money, you don't have to do anything. You can just use that money, other people will pay you interest, and you can live from that. And the miracle of interest is all about compound interest. And you get interest on interest, and so your money expands in this kind of way. Okay, so that's really my point too. Even if you stop letting banks create money uh, through debt in this kind of massive expansionary way, even if you allow people to continue to get interest on holding money, then you will still create this pressure for growth. So in a sustainable green economy, I believe, you cannot have interest on your money. So this has two quite important implications. I'm going to describe the impact that has on money for investment, savings that you put into investment, and also I'm going to talk about the impact it has on pensions. Because it's quite interesting, when you talk about money, and I've been doing this for quite a long time, you often get a very strong emotional response from people. And the reason is that deep in our heart of hearts, I believe, we think our money's keeping us safe. We think we're putting that money away, and then we're, when we're old and we can't work anymore, that money is then going to look after us. 
And actually, quite a lot of people also feel they can somehow, you know, exert power beyond the grave. I know my dad's like this. By, you know, by the way, they give that money away after their death, by how they write their wills. You know, that was a big thing. Anyway, I won't go into Victorian literature. But, um, yeah, so money makes you feel powerful. And this is why people are very scared of the fact that you challenge the way the money system works. Um, so I want to tell you about the Yak Bank, J-A-K, not that hairy creature that lives in Tibet, the Yak Bank in Sweden. The Yak Bank is a bank that operates without interest. And I know I'm going to call you Sawa, and that's your surname, isn't it? What's your first Safta. name? Safta. is going to talk about interest-free banking in a bit. But um, basically, the Yak Bank is a bank that already works, and it works without paying any interest. So the question is, why would people save with that bank? The way the Yak Bank works, really, is that you sort of, you could see it as borrowing from yourself at a different point in your life. And this is how interest-free banking operates in a similar way to how we might think about pensions. So I'm now going to draw, this is your life along here. No, sorry, this is your life. Okay? So here you're a child. I won't try and draw a child. If you'd ever come to any of my cars and you know how bad I am at drawing. This, although that's quite a nice curve, I think, isn't it? So this is you as a child. This is you as an old person. This is you in the productive part of your life here. Okay? Most of us are here at the moment, aren't we? Um, so, the point is, throughout your life, there's times when you put a lot out into the economy. That's this time. There's times when you're dependent on other people, and there's times in your older life when you're going to be dependent on other people. And my point is that we need to think about money, well, well we need to think, think about our economic productivity in terms of this kind of curve, rather than in terms of how we can use money to exercise power to look after ourselves. So, the problem with this kind of model here, is that you don't know how long that's going to be, do you? You're all kind of gambling, and that's what actuaries do for a living, on how long you're going to live after you stop being productive. And what the government's doing at the moment is this, aren't they? They're extending the bit that you work. So they're increasing my pension age all the time. I work in university. Um, so if you knew how long that was going to be and how long that was going to be, you'd earn money then and then you'd blast it all, but save enough for when you were old. Okay? Or, or top yourself when you get here or something. You can have a strategy, that's the point. But these are unknowns, so you can't develop a strategy. So now we have to imagine a world where there's not just your curve, there are lots of curves that belong to lots of different people. And on average, we all share our productive capacity across the life courses of all those people. Some people are always below the line, very disabled people, for example. Okay? But as a society, we all share, we share what's out there. So instead of saying, I've got my money, I'm going to put that money away, I'm going to claim interest on it, when I get to be old, that money's going to look after me. You need to rethink that, and you need to be thinking about your contribution in terms of a human community. Because what really keeps you safe is not having money stashed away in a bank somewhere, not even having children who you pay for to go to university so they can look after you when you're old, but actually trusting in a society and using that money sharing that money with other people across all your life courses. Five seconds left. Thank you very much. Chris Cook. Um, right. 21st century problems cannot be solved with 20th century solutions. Fact is, we have to go back at least 300 years to solve the banking problem, maybe a thousand years or more to solve the rest of the problem. I talk about three generations of money. First generation of money was decentralized but disconnected. Um, you had a physical market presence, and the first generation of money was a physical object. You had to be physically present in the market transact. The second generation of markets, which just died, whether it was on August 2007 or, the, or Lehman Brothers, that generation of markets collapsed and is now on life support. Uh, it's centralized but connected. Market presence is through middlemen. And second generation money is a credit object. Where we're going is next generation, decentralized but connected. Network market presence. This generation money will be a relationship. Now, <clears throat> the internet interprets censorship as damage and roots around it. I like that quote. It also interprets government and private sector banking or any other big corporate as damage as well and will root around them too. We're talking about direct connection, peer-to-peer. -peer. 
And I also talk about peer-to-asset, direct investment in assets. We need new instruments to achieve these direct connections. And we need a new generation of a trust framework. Because what banks and government provide is trust. We need a new way, a consensual agreement, in which we can do this. Lawrence Lessig, law is code. Well, it's just that lawyers are, pro are programmers who are paid maybe ten times more than the normal programmers. Mm. Now, we have to get to zero. What do I mean by this? Maths, simple. Plus one, minus one, zero. <coughs> Physics, positive, negative, neutral. <coughs> Economics, I'm afraid, isn't like that. Conflicting absolutes. Freehold, leasehold, debt, equity, public, private. There is no zero. Well, in Scotland, actually, there is. Guilty, not guilty, not proven. We have this third space in Scottish law. I'm saying what's needed generally is consensual agreement, not conflicting absolutes. 21st century agreements will be neutral, interactive, two-way, and consensual. Now, my colleague who is on next will tell you that east of Suez, consensus is normal. Trust is assumed. Sharia law is about consensus. For Japan, US has as many sumo wrestlers as Japan has attorneys. It's a lovely quote. They do in six pages what we do in 600, because trust is assumed. You lose face if you go to court. I'm going to be talking about financing and funding. The one useful thing so far that's come out of the Scottish Futures Trust, really, although good people, is the distinction between financing and funding. Financing is people-based credit, short-term, high-risk. Funding is asset-based credit, long-term, low-risk. I'm proposing two different consensual agreements to actually provide a framework of trust. For the Easy Guarantee Society is one of them. And I've invented a new word, I'll come to that, non-dominium. The second. Guarantee society. Well, it's dead easy. It's a mutual guarantee of direct credit between buyer and seller. Buyers and sellers cover the costs and make provisions into a pool in common ownership. And the credit allocation, who has how much use of the guarantee, is by a service provider formerly known as a bank. Now, this is not new. In London, shipping is insured by mutual P&I clubs. They're called mutual insurance, mutual risk, and it's been like that for 140 years. It's also recognisable to any student of Islamic finance as well as a model which has been around for thousands of years. The outcomes of this would be a community-owned visa credit clearing system. I mentioned earlier when I commented there are no deposits in the visa system, but this is ignored by all economists that I know of. This fact that Hang on, there are no deposits in the credit clearing system. What we need is a not-for-loss. I don't like not-for-profit and for-profit. I like not-for-loss or profit-for-purpose. We operate the system with no payments to rent-seeking shareholders or fat cap managers. People get what they deserve within the arrangement. And the value stays within the community who actually consent for the guarantee society. That's the first agreement. The second... How am I doing for time so far? Uh, three minutes left. How long? Three. Good God. <laughs> Non-dominion. A smart US lawyer wrote a new ownership agreement and called it a condominium. The condo went viral in the US. Debt-funded condos, now a US standard, codified with state-by-state -state quality control. Classic reality-based bottom-up policy. What works? A non-dominium arrangement is simply a condominium with the financing and the credit inside. That's what it looks like, and any student of Islamic finance will tell you that's Musharrafah, which I thought was a curry. The outcomes of this are it's neutral, it removes ego and politics, it's collaborative, social, and sustainable. And I'm just going to have to go on to the instrument that makes all this possible. These are tally sticks, accounting system. Basically, anybody know what stock is? That's the stock. I give that to you as a re essentially as um, a record of a debt which I now owe to you. And basically, this was the way that sovereigns actually 
uh, funded themselves for 500 years or more, right up to 1694. These were issued by the Exchequer to creditors, and this is the point. They were returnable in payment of taxes. The government, this is the king, funded himself by selling his taxes forward. That's what he did. Tax futures. Okay? This is undated credit, returnable in payment for use value of a productive asset. Okay? Sold at a discount, so I'm proposing a new generation of stock. Not based on taxes, but based on direct rental streams, direct streams of energy. And this is the, I've always fell over when I realised this. The very phrase, rate of return, isn't an interest rate. It's the rate at which stock can be returned to the issuer against what the production of the asset was. It blew me away when I realised what stock means and what rate of return where it comes from. So stock is not what you think it is. Stock is undated credit. The outcomes, well I've been through all these. The applications. Sustainable development. Energy and efficiency and good quality are in everybody's interests in this model. Funding, we can resolve on sustainable housing debt. I made a presentation to the top 20 UK housing associations last year on doing precisely this. We can release a pool of development credit. Affordable housing becomes easy when you're not paying compound interest. You're just paying a return on a stream of rentals. There's a lot becomes possible. Energy. I used to be a director of an energy exchange. And, you know, futures exchange. I believe that we can fund renewables with energy loans. Units redeemable in payment for energy. If your energy costs you nothing, you're funding, you know, you're taking 50 pound notes out of the fresh air and you're just selling that production forward. And it will give us a green deal that will actually work by selling savings to investors at a discount. Whew, ethical is optimal, is what I say. These two agreements share risk and reward equitably. Both are immediately recognised by Muslims as a Sharia compliant. Perhaps ethical is, opti is, is optimal. And I'm sorry if I run on. <laughs> 10 minutes is not real. <laughs> Let me and say that, that I'm not sure I understood all of that, but I think I sure as hell better. And <laughs> could I get that presentation uh, yeah, yeah. sent to me and then follow up? Sure. You? So, thank you very much. The last presenter before the discussion is Safta Sawa. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm not an economist. Uh, I'm not an, I'm an academic. I um, work. Um, in banking finance, I've been in banking finance for um, um, Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. I've been I worked in banking finance for about fifteen years and I left to set up my own investment company roughly about two years ago as is highlighted in the my bio. And what I'm speaking um, this afternoon is about um, Islamic finance as part of the IFC Islamic Finance Council which we, we are a body based in Scotland, uh, from Glasgow, who are out there doing work to promote, educate and raise awareness of Islamic finance across the UK and internationally. And I'll go back firstly to an industry that's grown substantially over the last um, 30 years or so. So what do I mean by Islamic finance? What, what do we mean by that in um, fundamental terms? <coughs> Um, Islamic finance is where, where, where Muslims, Muslims obviously have, have a faith based on um, in the Quran and um, brought down from, from God 1400 years ago. But as well as their faith, when they, when they went to pray, they, they do um, fasting during Ramadan and they give to charity. They're also meant to follow their life and that includes their business life uh, and their working life according to their faiths as well. So it's actually strict guidelines. Um, and, and rules and criteria that are laid down in respect to what they should and should not do. And one of the underpinnings of that issue is uh, excessive interest, or riba as we call it. Uh, Muslims, or we should, within Islamic finance, the, the, the payment or the receipt of excessive interest is prohibited. I mean, as we've heard this morning um, in terms of uh, some of the discussions, money has no real value in itself. It's, you know, you can print money, you can create money through the, the, the computers and, and create crazy numbers. It's got no real value. So the actual base of interest around that um, 
is prohibited. So around that issue around excessive interest, and, and there, there, therefore as well as that, around the moral values of actual ethical finance or ethical ways of working, um, Muslims are not meant to, to, to drink um, you know, alcohol, um, eat, eat pork, etc. So issues around investing in alcohol companies, pornography, defence are also very much relevant in that framework. It's an industry that's growing substantially um, in size. It's $1.3 trillion. That is roughly three quarters of the size of uh, the UK economy. It's so pretty significant. Very, very small from a global finance um, context. We're growing at 20% uh, per annum. And it's interesting now as well, as we've seen the credit crisis over the last uh, four years or so, normally we would see uh, the central banks as, as lenders of last resort to, to governments, and we've seen evidence of that, even to companies. But now, because even they're running out of capital, and they're, they're now doing points of easing, what are the governments doing now? They're running to the Gulf, they're running to Asia with their with their PowerPoint presentations and pitch books with respect to wanting infrastructure investment. And that works perfectly for Islamic finance. Because one of the key issues with Islamic finance, and it's been touched on earlier, is um, the weapons of mass destruction that Warren Buffett talked about, derivatives um, and the like. And, and Islamic finance is very much fundamentally based on asset-backed solutions. You can only invest in assets that you've actually got there. And it's, you do, they don't do speculation. There's a very, very limited derivatives market. So it's not like creating uh, you know, a bond and repackaging it and then creating another collateral round it and then selling that to somebody. So it's very much, for example, an Islamic bond, as a classic example, an Islamic bond that's a cook, um, which are very popular now for, for companies to, to raise capital on. You can raise an Islamic bond, but behind that Islamic bond, you must have an asset that's backed by that capital raising. And therefore, the bond uh, payment, the coupon payment on that bond, is not released on or related to some some interest payment. It's actually related to the underlying profitability of that company itself. The profits of that company, say for example, as a port operator go up, the the, the profits uh, to the bond holders go up. The the profits go down and vice versa, you know, you know, as well. And so it's very much a shared risk model where right now. In, in banking, you go to like, get get money from the banks, and they'll they'll lend you money, you know. But they, they won't take much risk. They take your, your your collateral, your security over your house or your business or whatever. But Islamic finance is very much venture capital based, private equity based, almost but without the leverage. So it's very much sharing risks. So you share the returns, but you also share the losses as well. So we've got to bear that in mind um, very much. So um, so it's you know, certainly a new way way of. Finance, you know, you know, as I said, a lot of governments are doing it. Even the UK government itself, uh, three years ago, just before the the, the, the credit crisis hit, the, the UK and the Lehman's went down, was looking itself to raise a treasury bond, a treasury guilt, based on Islamic finance principles, so they could actually tap into the Middle East and, and liquidity. Because in terms of numbers, um, and we all know all prices are high, are set to remain high. And Gulf liquidity, uh, Gulf potential investment into this industry is two to three trillion um, dollars, substantial sum of money when all the rest of the economies are, 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 are suffering. And as we well know, we've got our recession going on, but the recession is not a global recession, it's very much a Western economic recession. You know, the Gulf is still growing, a lot of countries in Asia are, are still growing as well in, in that respect. So, in, in some respects, as I said, Islamic finance historically uh, has been always been there for four, 1,400 years. For the last 30 years, it's been growing substantially. For the last 10 years, it's got had substantial momentum. Gordon Brown, when he was chancellor, um, was trying to open up London to those opportunities. UK companies now are, are taking advantage of that. There's a, there's, a, there's a development in the middle of central London in a city called the Shard. It's a really um, big uh, office uh, and residential development, again, backed by Islamic finance principles. And, and, and uh, even, even there's an IT company in Newcastle who wants to raise $10 million uh, dollars, uh, for their, uh, for their uh, business. They didn't go to the UK bond market. They didn't go to their existing shareholders. They actually raised money from uh, an Islamic bond structure. Even here in Scotland, we've, they raised some capital. Some, some of the companies have raised capital around 
um, Islamic um, traditions. And as well as that, we've also got areas where, where, where rather than lending, there's, there's a lot of charitable lending, philanthropic lending, lending by communities to other disadvantaged people around no interest. Um, it's called Cardi Hassan. So we're actually getting people pulled together, um, rich individuals, business owners, uh, who are prepared to lend to maybe other people for their businesses based around the Islamic principles, purely on the basis of their moral view that they want to help others out in that context as well. Um, in, in summary, I would say in Islamic finance, a very growing trend, um, a very interesting alternative mode of uh, um, finance for banking, for industries. We, we know in the credit crisis, no Islamic bank went under, had to be rescued. You know, everybody had difficulties in that time because of real estate lending and, and the like. But no, Islamic Bank actually went bankrupt um, in some respects. So, uh, and other now, now countries are following that model. And it remains to be seen um, how, how developed that goes. Because in one thing that you need to bear in mind is Islamic finance, while derived from the Quran and from the, from the Islamic faith, is for all, it's a form of ethical finance. It's a form of very, very, very much a, an ethical-based finance, no interest-based finance, and risk-sharing finance. And so, you know, people are actually um, taking the ret right returns as well as suffering the losses. Because as we well know, the, the people that are currently suffering the losses are not the, the banks, are, are, are the taxpayers. And I'll just finish on that note. Many thanks. So we have half an hour for questions and comments on the floor. I'm perfectly happy to take comments without the panel having to respond each time. And I would propose to give you more time to speak, but only one member of the panel speaks in response to one question. You might even want to direct a question to a particular member of the panel. So, Andy. Yeah, I'm not anticipating any response. I just want to throw in uh, what's interesting for me about um, this conference is that many, many things, obviously, but as much as anything else, how to begin to inculcate within our political processes, i.e. are the institutions within which decisions are made about how we are governed and how we live our lives uh, in, in politics and finance, how, how we actually inculcate these ideas safely without appearing to be a threat. And I think Chris has done this, you know, for example, with housing associations, etc., sort of coming in from the, from the side, as it were, to people. Um, I just want to sort of throw that in. That's very helpful. Thank you. That's quite, yep. Make sure the chair is in both directions. <laughs> <laughs> I was just interested to know what sorts of assets um, an Islamic bank would lend against. You know, it says it, you have to lend it against an asset. I'm just interested what that is. So, uh, so if I can answer that. So, now, yeah, I mean, um, Islamic finance or, or banks or intermediaries or institutions would lend against most assets provided. Um, uh, they, they fit into the, the ethical framework. For example, they wouldn't lend against a pub, um, as an example, or a pub company, or, or maybe an entertainment company or a nightclub, but you know, it's perfectly feasible for them to lend against property assets, is often the most common. Infrastructure assets, and port assets, and roads, and, and, and other health, hospitals, and the like. As long as it fits into that ethical screen that I kind of referred to at the start, they, they, that would be to Islamic finance in the framework. Yeah. I'm wondering, particularly Chris Cook, I think, um, a while ago I was at a workshop in London where a suggestion uh, was put forward that it would be possible for the subscribers to a utility, like a cell phone or mobile phone company, to actually uh, do a, a takeover of that company, if it's a publicly traded company, by having a sufficient number of the subscribers agree to sort of load onto their monthly bill a little bit of money that would be necessary to actually uh, you know, buy shares of that utility. So you'd end up having the, uh, the subscribers owning this the mobile phone company, uh, maybe the subscribers to a power company, a power generation company owning the utility, et cetera, and so on. So um, is that something that is related to your Guarantee Society idea? Well, it's, it's a variation on the theme um, of, of direct ownership through buying into, let's say, future production. I'll give you a couple of examples. I mean, the convergence of mobiles, mobile money, and banking, is, in the third world, it's just going absolutely bananas. You know, we're talking about, um, there's an easy payser in Pakistan, half a million users in the first month, 13 million users already. None of them have ever been near a bank. 
okay? And they never will go to the bank. But telcos are setting up their own bank. A guy, guy used to be strategic director of Orange told me that they banned prepayment cards above a certain limit because people held them in preference to Egyptian money. Okay? <laughs> so communications has a value in exchange, yes. And if you prepay on communications value, and if you went to your users and said, look, how would you actually just, how, how do you fancy paying now for a, you know, a, let's call it communication stock, right? You sell it forward. Yes, that's the logic. You're selling your entity to your customers. Makes so much sense. So I thought it yeah. Um, I want to challenge Molly's axiom. Yay! <laughs> and uh, I, I'm not going to be able to make a proper challenge to it, but I'm sure other people will, will, will help me. Um, the axiom, as I remember it, is that an economy can't go forever um, when you're limited by the resources of the planet. Something like that, yeah. yeah. Well, we do an awful lot of things that don't actually use any physical resources. You know, we, we entertain each other, we, um, we go and visit people, you know, the, the, there are lots of activities and also there are lots of activities that we can do um, which burn energy which we can produce from renewable uh, resources. So surely the, the limit of growth is the amount of money that is put into the economy rather than the, the physical resources that we discussed. Okay. Mm -hmm. I will. Yeah. Okay. Can I do that one now? So, um, yeah, Richard Dowsbrake wrote a very nice chapter for a book I published in 1999 called "Is There Such a Thing as Green Growth?" And he addressed a lot of these points. What kind of things can we do? Like, it's about improving the quality of our economy without increasing quantity, yes. and that is exactly the kind of thing we need to be looking for. But it's pretty difficult. There are some conditions there, and it's pretty difficult to meet those conditions, actually, because you say, what sort of things we can do? We can go and visit each other. Well, OK, so we'd have to walk. So we couldn't go and visit people who were very far away. Or ride a bicycle. OK, so if you get no, in the no, car... No, 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 how, no, how no, no please, please, wait a minute. I mean, we, can, we can produce electricity to charge a battery to... to uh, OK, so, so now we get to your point about different kinds of energy. So now we're saying that renewable energy is completely carbon neutral, which, again, I don't accept, because when you build a renewable energy station, you're creating you're pouring concrete. OK, you're, you're, you have to build a whole load of extra infrastructure, all of which produces carbon dioxide and uses energy. Then there's, there's embodied energy in, in you know, what you do probably when you're with your friend. Herman Daly did a very interesting paper about the, the environmental impact of a symphony orchestra, for example. You know, he's saying this is improving the quality of our life. Does it have any impact in terms of resources? And he showed, showed what the impact was there. So I'm absolutely, yeah, I mean, I put that in as an axiom because I think what, what people are looking at when they say you can have economic growth, you know, you, you can decouple economic growth from material and resources. They are looking for infinite increases in efficiency, and at some point we're going to come across to the efficiency <coughs> limit. And Tim Jackson suggests that if we're going to have equality, uh, to achieve growth on the scale, we have to get 128-fold improvements in efficiency by 2050 which I suggest is just untenable. So even if we could have a little discussion, we could find some things we could do to improve the quality of the economy without increasing its quantity. It will be so marginal compared to this massive growth impact that we're having as a result of the money system. Sorry, what do you say? I've got three. three. I, I, if I, oh, I, was wondering, I was wondering to support this point. I mean, there may be down the end of the tunnel, you know, a thousand years hence, because I mean, some kind of cheap and absolute limit or that, but, but I don't think I even buy that because I mean, I think if you, look, if you compare our situation now with 100 years ago or 200 years ago, you try and compare it in money, you realise, I think, after a little bit, that we're talking about difference of quality in, in life, yeah. not, not, not quantity. Exactly. Yeah, but one, one of the real, the basic problems about money, I mean, money is a terrific invention for human society, but one of the problems about it is it's a, it measures everything on a single dimension. And you know, we have at the moment the government sponsor things, trying to work out government sort of happiness indexes and so on like that. Um, and you know, we, we can, uh, so, so I just think that, you know, probably, I mean, it may well be that, 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 they, that, that they, we want to have everyone employed and so on. And it's much more difficult to put people's salaries down and up and so on. You know, it seems to me that, to an extent, we may be fooling it ourselves because it may be, we may be changing something different rather than better. But I think that we think we're going up by, let's say, 2% in money terms each year indefinitely. Could well be possible. I mean, we need a huge shift. We need a shift away from energy. But I mean, 
I strongly support Malcolm Slater, who is arguing that we should tax energy, and in particular carbon-based energy, long before there's worries about climate change, when there's simply worries about fossil fuels running out. Mm. So, here else on this point, on the panel. Yeah, definitely. It's about what are you denominating growth in? Yes, yes. You know, at the minute we're denominating it in symbols. You know, and those symbols are completely worthless. They're just deficit based a vacuum. And if we actually throw money then, try denominating it in energy. No, no, no. Try denominating it in energy. An energy the currency, answer. Molly, is not the same thing as a unit of account. You can no more run out of kilograms and meters than you can run out of units of account. No, I didn't say use energy money, that's a different word. What I'm saying is use as your measure energy rather yeah. than money as your way of measuring what happens. That's what I try to do. Well, that's what you try to do. Yeah. That's what I'm advocating. <laughs> So we are in violent agreement. Malcolm Sessor's basic point was indeed exactly that, 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 that we have to live within what's possible in energy terms. That, that but we're clearly not doing that, are we? Because no. even our government says we have to reduce our energy use by 60%. Yeah. We're agreeing with people saying 90%. And we have never yeah. actually yeah. reduced our energy use at all. In fact, the only reason I voted Conservative last time was I knew they were really <laughs> just to get some more voices in, you were you were next. I just wanted to more to clarify your uh, comments. Exponential growth or all growth? I think eventually yeah, any any growth because unless and because you're going to have growth on growth, so you're going to have a compounding effect. So it will be exponential growth, won't it? No. Well, right, no, it's no, it's not the exponential function. Yeah. yeah. It's a concept for human. Can I just jump on and point something out? That okay, yeah. compounded growth then is what I'm talking about. Growth and then you, another growth. So I'm saying exponential. Growth. What yeah. the problem is, is the idea that money is permanent. Like if you have money that ran out after, you know, it, you know yeah. a, a 10 pound note was worth 10 pounds for three years and then it wasn't worth anything or whatever, then this problem would go away instantly. So one way to deal with this is not to have permanent money, like those numbers are infinitely You're active. talking entropy. Yeah. No, hang on a second. Just because you were still, because what the money would have done is it would have changed what's going on out there. And that change would have a built-in amount of energy use associated yeah, with it. Yeah, so even if the money had gone, the, the stuff and the energy and the activity no, well, would still be there. There's an, a daily amount of sunlight in this planet, a huge amount of sunlight. That is our basic energy source, yeah. and that's what we can then transform in order to create organized systems. That's why we can defeat entropy on a localized basis because... Well, when that works, constant. I'll believe you. Well, but at the moment, we're still using more and more energy anyway. Well, I'm going to shut well, up. Can I just bring in the... There's no question around this. Like uh, 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 yes, but um, we, we, we seem to be confusing money, which has been pointed out as just a unit of account, with energy use. And this isn't the forum to discuss energy use. Exactly. But what I'm, what I'm trying to get to is it is possible to have... Uh, a, a capitalist uh, mindset with money without using any more energy than, than you would use if you were being as green as we possibly can be. That's, that's why I'm, I'm trying to disassociate the two so that we can then start talking about money without having this green Pokemon behind us. <laughs> it's very difficult though, isn't it? Because what, what we found in the climate, what people find in the climate sector is that any money saved energy efficiency is then spent somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately there is a very that close a cultural thing between the two. That's right? a cultural thing. No, it's not. It's no, not it's just cultural. No, no, this is why actually the point that you read is very, I think, very helpful. But of course it goes back to all tests for the economics. If I had Anne for here, I was much more with her in, in the, in the pre-2000 era in the Jubilee campaign. The idea behind the Jubilee campaign comes from the Hebrew scriptures, and that's the idea that land values uh, cannot indefinitely be, uh, be carted around between people and can't be indefinitely accumulated. Every 50 years, all land-based debt goes back to zero. And so actually, I think this is a very clever principle, and in some ways it's also connected with atomic finance. But, but I do think that there's a real point there, that uh, you know, if we have absolute money, we then end up with absolute property and, and accumulation. And there's a I mean, for me, from a theological perspective, it, the, pro the problem is with absolute money, not actually a direct correlation between money and energy. If you can find a way to de absolutize money, yep. you would resolve a lot of these problems. And I, I, I suspect yeah. that that's what we're trying to It's like a more relational yeah. account yeah. of how, how, how do you distribute it fairly then? How would you distribute it? Yeah. That's where, that's where the, the, the concept of a non dominium, the word I invented because there wasn't one, comes into it. Because that's about the fair sharing of equity, the equitable sharing of risk and reward. 
And that's what has been around for thousands of years. I'm just saying we should go back to that. Marcel Mauss wrote about this in his book, The Dawn, <laughs> or The Gift, and he described the potluck, you know, the Native Americans. We, the British and the others, went off to America. We saw them doing this weird thing every two or three years, burning all the mass, mm -hmm. all the surplus, and we thought they were completely nuts. Mm -hmm. But actually, it looks a lot better than what the Americans have been doing in the last <laughs> three years, you know, tying themselves down for indefinitely. So I, I want to clarify, I, I don't think... I don't think I'm saying that money has to lead to exponential growth. What I'm saying is money like this, the yes. kind of money yes. creation yeah. in this way. So I'm not particularly saying, I mean, then there's a question about whether you would have capitalism if you didn't have this kind of money system. And in a way, that's a theoretical discussion, because once we've sorted out the money system, then we can see what we've got left. Yeah. And in terms of how you share out the money, I think you should spend it out as a citizen's income. So I think I'm agreeing with Chris. In fact, everybody in the panel agrees yeah. yeah. with that. Yeah. Yeah. Is it just that Ben Dyson should run for parliament at some point? I see a new hand up in the back. So, is it possible to have equality amongst humans <laughs> with money? Equity, yes. Oh. Equality, don't confuse equity with equality. Okay? Yeah, that, 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 that. Equity is fairness. Okay? And life, it, life ain't fair, you know? And, and the gifts out there are not necessarily you know, equally distributed. But everybody should have an equitable chance. You know, we should all have equal, you know, equitable you access. You, can I have a go at your question and just get back to Jesus? Yeah, I mean, and to break it down into, like, are there enough uh, resources in the world to, like, feed and clothe everyone? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, there's so money waiting. The, the, point is about, the point is about the Jubilee, that some people are better at accumulating money than us yeah, for sure. various reasons, right? So over time, um, money will accumulate in certain quarters and drift away, and so will land and other resources. Yes. So uh, every now and then, and you know, in, um, is it Ecclesiastes or is it? It's in Leviticus. Leviticus, there you go. Um, you know, chapter 26, verse 26. 25. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so you start again on Yeah, you have to redistribute everything, okay? Because it will have accumulated. So that's the answer. So the value of, of, of land at that point, and then people who have been enslaved by losing land then get to start again. And this is what we've not worked out in in our Western economy, really since the 15th century, when a small number of people took the land from the majority. Yeah. Yeah. And that process is still going on. Yeah. And the problem is we no longer teach history in school, so I find my undergraduates yeah. don't even know about this. Mm -hmm. They yeah. don't know that a small number of people stole the wealth from everybody else yeah. 500 years ago. And if you don't know that, you don't know what's going on in the world today. That's the end of my lecture. There's some new, another question. Uh, I want to bring in more voices back from there. I also yeah. said that. Um, do you think that's still as relevant today as it was when yeah. it was done in the past? Because think about the past would be a much, much smaller scale. Still happening in China, more. India, Amazon, yeah. Africa. Africa. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Do you not think that perhaps with the scale of the society and economy that we have today, there would actually perhaps be a lot more destruction of um, you know, the, just the economy and the, you know, the, the system of production that's been established by actually just trying to you know, completely wipe, wipe everything and, and start again? Do, do you see what I mean? Do you not, do you not think perhaps that we'd actually um, lose more by trying to do that? Yeah, I, th I, th I don't think you can do it in a sort of quick, overnight switch, I think, with the chaos. Um, what I think you can do is unwind a lot of the situation we've got into with the debts, um, and you will probably need some kind of redistribution to an extent, because you know the system as it is structured does lead to certain people accumulating more and more, and the more they accumulate, the faster they accumulates, that accelerates. Um, but yeah, I, d I don't really think you can have like a reset and then we all start again. Um, but I think you can sort of unwind the situation we've got into and make it much more... Can I speak up for the possibility that it still can happen in the modern world? After the Second World War, America oversaw land redistribution in Japan to undermine imperialism, mm -hmm. internal imperialism. Mm -hmm. uh, then there was a significant land distribution in Taiwan, yeah. mm -hmm. and there was significant land distribution in Kerala. Now, if you look at Asia today, there's a still, well, Japan had its issues because, again, it got back into land, into concentrated speculation on land, mm -hmm. and that was a mistake. So they seized it. But Taiwan and Kerala, were, uh, and uh, there was similar, and, and South Korea was another one. All three economies benefited massively mm -hmm. from land reform in the 50s and continue to do so today. I believe myself, and this take, I spoke about this on the panel, but I actually think that the UK would benefit massively from land reform. Let's uh, not forget money, land reform. Everybody in this country should be given an anchor. There should be a way that we can organise that. The Duke of McClure won't like it. Well, I'm sorry. You know? 
<laughs> You're all distressing us from the last question. Can I just give another example on that? This, the, the case of Hong Kong, in fact, Hong Kong is one of the most interesting places on the planet. They have no central bank. Okay? Mm. How many people knew they don't have a central bank? They have a monetary authority, but no central bank. And the, the private banks issue the money. Also, most of, of their income, a great deal of public income, comes from land rentals. Because the freehold was owned by the Crown, and they basically took a land rental by selling long leases. But if, if you haven't got a landlord and the tax man on your shoulder, you're far more likely to have more money coming to you for entrepreneurialism. Uh, having brought land up, I should invite Andy to have a say. Yeah, I don't really want to go there, but it's <laughs> tempting. But, um, <laughs> do you have a question of, of, of redistribution? Because, I mean, we're kind of, as it were, getting a little bit away, but actually some of these things are actually quite fundamental. Because they get back to my first point is, what are the ways mm. into this, yeah. which you might not expect? So you find the bogey mm. coming in the back door, and you were expecting in the front door. It's quite useful. But one of the most effective means of redistribution is the one certain thing that happens to all humans is they die. And we're very bad at dealing with death. Because redistribution, in the countries which have uh, basically reset at death, you have much, much higher levels of equality, mm. which you would expect. Mm. In countries like Scotland, where we only abolished primogeniture in 1964, and still children have got no legal rights to inherit, we are now at levels of inequality in terms of wealth, all assets, we last experienced in 1899. So in terms of mechanisms, inheritance, <coughs> is one of the most useful mechanisms because all this debt overhang is claims on the future, much of which we hope will accrue to our children mm -hmm. who have no bloody right to it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm good for 100%. Point. Yeah. Can, I, can I just answer that? I'm for 100% um, reversion to the state on death, and so was John Stuart Mill at well known yep. radical. Exactly. And this, this kind of ties in with what I was saying here, but the Green Party's policy, which I think is a good one, is that you should at least, you, you pay less inheritance tax if you share your inheritance out more widely. Yeah. So the inheritance tax relates to the inheritee, rather, the inheritor yeah. rather than the inheritee. So that's an automatic okay. incentive to but share. We would have the problem, we would have the problem but, but English, English trust at all. But, but the other thing about that is, is we, we had, I think, a period in the, was it the 1950s, 60s, 70s, when we had very high inheritance taxes. And you look at, the, you mentioned the two estates. I mean, some of the land of the estates, the big things got broken up. Where it happened that a couple of dukes, you know, one and his son died in quick succession, they got totally hammered. But after that, two things happened. The tax rates were lowered again, and also they began to find ways to avoid it. I don't, I don't think the way around... I mean, we are, the, the key point, I think, here is that we are one of the most unequal societies in the, the world, so in, in the civilised world. I mean, the, only the US is significantly worse. So, I mean, that's, so I, I don't think we need to have drastic 100% tax here or whatever. You know, I think we just... But that's the reason why we're unequal. Because well, no, we, no, we, no, come on, that's... that's oh, yeah. It's not income, income, it's well. Yeah, yeah. Sure, I'm, I'm agreeing with you, Andy, I'm just saying, I don't think we need to impose 100% yeah, yeah. rates. We just need some, we just need reasonable rates that can't be avoided, that chip away at the front. We need to do something to very high income, too. Um, Jeff, oh, oh, um, I wonder whether the notion of trade will energy quotas in relation to carbon uh, would have feed in here, because it has something to do with climate change that we haven't talked about, but I'm sure underpins a lot of what we're thinking about. It relates to distributing things on the basis of a per capita uh, 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 allowance on an annual basis, perhaps. Would you like to comment on that? Not my own expertise, so I won't. Do you know what? It is Green Party policy, and I don't agree with it again. I'm joking. I'm going to get sacked. But um, the thing is, tradable emission quotas means you basically have a ration of carbon. You have a, you're allocated that every year, and everything you buy, ultimately everything you buy that has carbon embodied in it, you get a little credit card, and they yeah. take off enough carbon to, to represent the carbon in what you bought. Now... At the moment, it's only proposed in terms of energy. So you go to, to buy some petrol for your car, you've got your credit card in, you've got your carbon card in. Okay, so, so you're now controlling your carbon budget, as it were. But the problem with that, the problem that I see with the policy is that to work, it would have to, cons it would have to consider the carbon in everything, the carbon in this pen, the carbon in everything you bought. And that is such a complex process. That, it goes as far as the civil service, and they said that's too complicated. Yeah. And I've got to say, I'm going to go at primary energy level, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is what Jim Hansen suggested. Sorry, this is. Can I interject? Press, can I interject? This is actually, if I may say so, a sort of core competence. I used to run an energy exchange, I have some views on this. Somebody at the conference I was at said, if you want to keep a donkey healthy, you don't regulate what comes out of it, you regulate what goes in, right? What emissions is doing is trying to make valuable something with no intrinsic worth. I'm operating 
at the other end of the donkey. Let's actually make more valuable the you know, carbon, which is, if you go to Iran and places like that where I'm working quite a bit, you're actually seeing, you know, Nigeria flares as much gas as will power Brazil. Why? Because it's free. I mean, if we can actually convince them, and I believe we can, to raise the price to the market level and then pay an energy dividend in gas units to people, gas units are valuable because they've got the energy value. So this is what we should be doing. We should be monetizing energy, coming up with carbon dividends, putting the price sky high to discourage people consuming it, and then people have a choice. You can either waste it by spending it profligately, or you can exchange it for something valuable like your end or whatever it is. That's the way to do it. Yeah. But I think Jim, Jim Hansen, who's, who's you know, leading the climate change by suggesting it, but in, in a very simple term, you, you tax the carbon highly, but you just you just give a check for four thousand pounds to every adult or whatever each year. And that for, for yeah. someone who's poor, who consumes less than average energy, that, that they should end up in traffic. Someone who has two cars and flies the airplane flops and so on, it's going to end up worse yeah. off. Just okay. yeah, sorry, just as we've got five minutes left, I wondered if anybody has any questions about money or banking specifically. Yeah. That way. Yeah. Um, there was someone over the back there, um, a lady. Well, it was just going to be a suggestion that could we restrict the discussion to banking, although the others are all worthwhile topics. Yeah. <laughs> For the last five minutes, we yes, were, so, um, just briefly answer. I don't know if any panel to comment on this because I, I know Professor Werner was talking about local currencies, and in my travels recently, I've noticed quite a few local currency schemes. Like I was just in Seville recently, and I wandered, I managed to wander into the launch of a local currency. As the third local currency has been launched in a small neighbourhood in Seville, and it seems to be quite popular. We've had this local currency in Brixton, and I just want to.